Hello, um, I just finished watching the first episode of Star Trek Picard, and I'm going to do a recap and basically give some of my notes on it, what I thought, and all in all, I didn't think it was as bad as it could have been. I mean, okay, there were a few parts in it that were bleh, but all in all, it really wasn't all that bad. I was entertained. I was caught up in the story. I generally enjoyed what I just saw. So it begins in an apartment with a girl. Her name's Dodge. She's one of the main characters. Um, she's in there with a boyfriend. And yeah, the boyfriend in the start is just a little much. So the dialogue was a little cringy. Sure, okay. Um, they use the word dude and cool, which I guess those words could still be in use in the 24th century, but we never heard anyone say the word dude or cool besides Tom Paris anywhere in TNG or DS9 or Voyager, so it, it feels out of place. And this was a thing in Discovery that they used just language it just really felt out of place to me, the way that they spoke in all of Star Trek. So that's my first criticism right there. Dawes is with her boyfriend, and she tells him that she's been accepted to the Daystrom Institute. And then some hunter, assassin people beam in and attack them. And her boyfriend is instantly killed, which there's no characterization. We don't get to know him, don't get to know her. It's just jump right into it. And then she goes all River Tam on them and takes them out. Okay, it was kind of epic, but sure. Okay, so we cut to Chateau Picard. Um, he has an interview today, and he's got two assistants living with him who are Romulan refugees. And I don't know their names off the top of my head, sorry. But there's holographics everywhere. Everything is holographic. Like in Dodger's apartment... She had a holographic replicator. The assassin who tried to kidnap her put like a device on her head and it had, was holographic and they had like a holographic interface that was like a touchscreen phone almost. The problem, see these holograms would fit in just fine here since we were establishing holographics in Voyager in Deep Space Nine. But the problem with these holograms now is that they use so many goddamn fucking holograms in Discovery that now these holograms are less impressive since we've established that we had holograms 140 years ago, which, uh, those holograms in Discovery drive me fucking crazy. But, okay. They fit here because in DS9, The Visitor, which what took place in the future, or well, an aborted future, let's say, Dax in that future, she, when they pulled the Defiant out of mothballs, she said it was weird to be using 2D interfaces, so that actually works that there are holograms here. What doesn't work are all the holograms in Discovery. So, the interview... Okay, so Chateau Picard also looks nothing like it did in Next Generation. However, that kind of works, because in Star Trek Generations, in the movie, um, his brother Robert died in a fire, and for all we know, that fire burned down the whole house. So the house he's living in now could be one that Picard moved back and he built himself. So it's actually, it could work in story that Chateau Picard looks completely different than Once Upon a Time it did. So that's actually not a problem. His dog is named number one and he catches and kills a bird and nobody seems to have a problem with that. Picard calls him an assassin. I thought that was a little weird, but sure, okay, whatever. Let's see here. Picard orders T. O. Gray decaf. Thought that was kind of cute. It shows a new circa 2399 replicator. I, I liked that. That was cool. Okay, the supernova that takes out the Romulan Empire is dumb. Okay? If a star goes supernova, you can see this coming. It doesn't travel faster than the speed of light. I know various things like Stowe, Star Trek Online and stuff have attempted to explain it as it was in subspace, it was this, it was that. No. This is more Alex Kurtzman not understanding how space works and doubling down on his 
stupid ass storyline from Star Trek 09. Okay? A supernova can't threaten an entire galaxy. It, it threatens the star system at most. Okay? They would see it coming. It couldn't destroy the Romulan homeworld unless it was the Romulan star itself that went supernova. So the supernova is just dumb, and it always will be dumb. Um, and I have to wonder why, why, why does Alex Kurtzman hate Romulans? You know, why does J.J. Abrams hate the Romulans? In Star Trek 09, they blew up Romulus, and then they blew up Vulcan. Why do they hate people with pointy ears? That's a question I've always had. Why? Why do they hate them? They have an interview with a lady who's interviewing Picard, and she kind of doubles down on him about him trying to help the Romulan Empire, and that the Federation offered to help evacuate Romulus. And that there were millions of people that needed to be evacuated. And this to me is another plot hole. That, okay, I get it. There are millions of people and that might be a hard thing to evacuate. But you've got to understand it's the Romulan Empire, okay? They have the Dideradexes. They have the Valdors. These are huge ships. They have other planets in their empire. They have other ships. They are not limited to one planet with just a handful of ships. They should be able to evacuate one planet. They pull all their resources. I don't understand why they need the Federation to build 10,000 ships to help them evacuate Romulus. The Romulans would never turn to the Federation for help. They could do it themselves, or at the very least, they could evacuate a huge portion of their people. It's the Romulan Empire. They are an empire. They control huge swaths of territory. They would not be an allegory to refugees today coming to the U.S. They, the Romulans have lots and lots of planets, okay? They wouldn't be a refugee species. They would be able to relocate and reestablish themselves if they lost Romulus, which, again, the supernova is stupid. So the interviewer basically grills Picard on trying to help people who aren't Federation and aren't them and were their enemy. The way the interviewer comes down on Picard is a whole Trumpism thing. It's, it's, uh, it's inserting today's politics into their world, which again, I think is stupid. The Federation is, they care about all sentient life. And this reporter's coming down on Picard for trying to help others. And Picard says that he lost faith in Starfleet because it wasn't Starfleet anymore because they weren't willing to help others. And again, Starfleet would never do that. And it's kind of stupid, but okay, whatever. Moving on from the stupid interview, the supernova is still dumb. The Romulans can take care of themselves. They wouldn't be refugees. Uh... So, in the interview, they say the Utopia of Planitia was completely destroyed and that flammable vapor was ignited in the stratosphere and that to this day, Mars is still on fire and that 92,143 lives were lost. Wow. Um, I thought Mars was completely terraformed. Why is there flammable vapor in the stratosphere? Why is the planet still burning? What? That makes very little sense to me. Um, what? 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 It's the 24th century. Can't they put out a burning atmosphere? Can't they do something about that? These people have the ability to terraform planets. They have atmospheric control systems. But Mars is still burning. And this was done by synthetics that were developed by the Daystrom Institute based off of data. And because of this attack, all synths were outlawed. There was a ban on synths, so I guess we're in a Blade Runner type of world? I, I don't know. Um, there's a ban on synthetics. They question Data, and they in the interview, they question whether or not, you know, he was a synthetic and whether or not he could be trusted, and Picard doubles down that he was one of his best people, which he was. You, you can't question Data. Shut the fuck up. You can't question Data. So, Picard lost faith in the Federation because of all of that. Okay, and then Picard also s mentions Dunkirk and mentions that the interviewer doesn't even know what that is. And she doesn't even know history, so she doesn't even have the qualification to interview him. Because she doesn't even know what she's talking about. Which, that's Picard right there. That's Patrick Stewart owning the character, and I rather enjoyed that. In the next scene, 
Dodge, she sees the interview and something in her tells her to come track down Picard and she comes to Picard in France and the dog runs over to her <laughs> and something that made me laugh, the dog has big old balls and it made me think of the Orville in the first episode when they see the dog licking its balls on screen that that was goofy and I couldn't not see that because of uh, the Orville so thanks for that guys thanks for that Seth Dodge apparently needs help from Picard because her boyfriend was murdered she comes to Picard because she knows who she is Picard doesn't turn around he's willing to listen to her because he's a good man he's willing to help anyone because he's Picard uh, in the next scene we see a dermal regenerator used to fix the gash on her head from the attack we need to see a dermal regenerator. Thank you. Dodge asks Picard if he's ever been felt like he was a stranger to himself. And he says many, many, many times. Um, Dodge mentions her father. We don't know who this is. I'm pretty sure. Well, I'll, I'll talk about that later. She has a necklace. She shows it to Picard. Uh, Picard is willing to believe in her. He doesn't dismiss her. This is very much to, uh, Picard's character. He says that she was a bad person. That number one, his dog would let him know, and the dog warms up to her. So Dodge, the dog doesn't mind Dodge, and eh, that's all good. So in the next sequence, uh, Picard has a dream of Data painting. Now this is the second dream with Data in it. The first one, the, sh the okay, the episode actually opens up on a shot of the Enterprise D, which is a dream sequence, and we kind of shouldn't see the exterior of the ship in a dream sequence, but maybe he's dreaming of the ship. So. It's fine showing the Enterprise. The Enterprise looked beautiful. More Starship porn, please. Very nice. So in the second dream sequence, we see Data painting. Um, and Picard realizes, he walks up to Data, and he sees Data painting a painting. And Data asks, he's, they're in TNG uniforms. They look spot on. Um, Data's hair isn't quite right. Neither is his eyes. Perhaps 25% different. I don't know. But... De-aging on Data has been done pretty well in this, and he looks pretty good. The uniforms are spot on, they look good. Data hands or offers to hand the paintbrush to Picard and asks if he'd like to finish it. He says he doesn't know how. And he wakes he wakes up and he sees that the painting that Data was working on is on the wall and that he knows Dodge somehow. And uh, when Picard wakes up, there's a tune coming from uh, his bells on his walls from the clock and I I know that whatever tune was coming from that clock is Relevant to Star Trek. I just couldn't quite place where it's from. Maybe it was Farrah Jaka I wasn't quite sure but that that music is familiar to Star Trek. I know that um, When he looks at his wall and the painting the data was working on is on the wall So he realizes that somehow he knows Dodge so then we cut to San Francisco and San Francisco looks very futuristic. It looks different than how we've ever seen it. But, you know, we never really got to see San Francisco. We've never really seen everything in the future in the 24th century. So I accept the way the San Francisco looked. I thought it looked just fine. The one thing that bothered me was the shot of the Golden Gate Bridge was recycled CGI from Discovery. And it had the solar panels on top of it. And it looks different than how we've ever seen it before. Okay, fine. I'll let that one go. Recycled Disco Golden Bridge. Sure. So we cut to the Starfleet Quantum Archives, and Picard, it's a Starfleet Museum Quantum Archives, and Picard wants access to his personal archives, and he's talking to a holographic interface, which is a person that's walking that has a program, but it's a hologram. He asks, only I have access to it, correct? And she says, yeah. And he says, okay, well, I need to see it. And then for privacy reasons, she disappears, and he goes into his archive. And when you go in there, there's a Batleth, there's a Dactarg. Those are probably given to him by Worf. That was nice. We see the Captain McCard Day banner. That was also cool. And then there's a model of the Stargazer, of the Enterprise D, of the Enterprise E, and an Enterprise E shuttle from Nemesis. Great attention to detail. Loved seeing those things in there. So in the Starfleet Quantum or Starfleet Museum Quantum Archives, we see him use a little pad with an L cars on it. Thank you. A pad. No holograms, L cars. Thank you. TNG. That's what we want to see. And it makes a box appear, which I guess was held in transporter stasis or something. Kind of cool how it just kind of 
beams in there. It was a cool thing. And the box kind of unfolds. It looks like kind of a transformer mass shifting thing. The box transforms into like a smaller box. It was pretty cool. Inside the box is a painting that Data painted in 2369. It is one of two paintings. The other one is in his house. The other one's in the archive. He uh, calls for the holographic assistant and asks what the painting is. The assistant tells Picard that it was painted by Data circa 2369 and it's a painting of Dodge. So Picard immediately knows something is up. He asks if anyone has ever accessed his archive and the holographic index tells him no, nobody's been here. No one except you. No one has that authorization. And she tells him that the painting is entitled Daughter. So instantly you're getting the idea that Dodge has a connection to Data. So we cut to 24th century Paris, which again looks completely different than how we've ever seen it depicted before, which could be a continuity error, but again, we're making this in 2020. So I forgive any discontinuity in the way that it looks because Paris, futuristic, it looks like Paris and it looks beautiful. There are hover cars everywhere. I like the hover cars, they're cool. And so Dodge, she is hiding on the streets of Paris she calls her mom on a holographic phone that's kind of in her hand. It's a holographic communication device. I think that's kind of cool. Um, we've never seen how civilians call each other or anything um, in the 24th century. You know, we've seen comm badges, but we've never seen how people talk and stuff. And it would make sense that there would be some kind of allegory to a phone. And it's a little holographic thing, and I think that's pretty cool. She basically tells her mom that her boyfriend was murdered and her mom tries to calm her down. She says she needs to go back to Picard. She's like, wait a minute, how do you know about Picard? I didn't tell you about that. And she's like, you must have. She's like, no, I didn't. And she's like, well, you need to go back to him. So instantly you know that something's up. Um, you know, that could be just bad writing. Her saying, oh, well, you must have said something. That response right there is a trope from so many TV shows. Um, no, that's just bad writing. But also it's probably part of the plot. She probably knows she went to Picard, knows there's a reason she went to Picard, because you need to find Picard. She hangs up with her mom, she pulls up a thing, does a whole bunch of really fast, quick accessing stuff and tracks down and pinpoints Picard in San Francisco. It's kind of cool how she tracks him down. And since you're already getting the point that she might be Data's daughter, the way that she does this accessing stuff, it looks kind of like something an android would do. And it's a cool thing. We cut to San Francisco. And she catches up with Picard, probably being there somehow. And Picard uh, is already starting to piece it together. And she tells him that she can hear conversations up to a block away. And she thinks she's schizo or something. Or maybe she's got brain damage or something. He says, no, you're not schizophrenic. And he tells her about Data, that he was a very important person, a decorated Starfleet officer, and that he was an android. And she's like, you mean like the androids who attacked Mars? And he's like, oh, no, 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 not like that. He was a decorated officer. He was my best, he was one of my best people. He was one of my friends. And already, the attack on Utopia Planitia at Mars is kind of being treated like the UFP 9-11, which, you know, you would think that the 9-11 incident would be when the Breen attacked Earth in Deep Space Nine. But I guess the attack on Mars and the fact that Mars is still burning is more fresh in people's minds. So that's the current 9-11. Uh, okay. Um, anyway, he tells her that Data was a decorated Starfleet officer and that he sacrificed himself for Picard. And he obviously feels really deeply, very guilty about it. It was about two decades ago. He tells her that Data painted a picture of her that would have been 30 years ago and the painting was named Daughter. He tells her that she tracked him down and that she would have needed security clearance that she doesn't have in order to track him down, so she might be an android. She's like, you mean like I could be a murder machine? Something like that? And he's like, no, no, you're something special. You could be something very special if you're Data's daughter. And he's starting to think that she's a soon type android that's made out of flesh and blood and that maybe the attack that happened to her triggered some kind of positronic alarm bell. She tries to tell him that no, she's a human, and that her father named her Orchidenicae Deja Onacidium. I am not pronouncing that right. But her full name is Orchidenicae Deja Orchidinium. Her father named her that after two orchid genomes he spliced together. It means yellow and pink. And 
she's afraid she's some kind of murder machine, but Picard tries to tell her that she's something special. I'm going to guess here at this point that her father is Bruce Maddox, which we learn later on more about that. Picard wants to take her to the Daystrom Institute in uh, Okinawa. She says she was accepted, and Picard says that's brilliant when she tells him that she was accepted as a fellow. And then, right then, she realizes they found him. She hears it, and she hears him coming. She says they have to run for it, and here's something that was something I noticed. She says they have to run for it, and they start running up a building, and Picard gets winded going up this building and gets tired. And that's something that in the world of Star Trek doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me and I'll tell you why. Because in this world, people can live to be at least 200 years old. So if Picard is in his 80s right now, 80 is the new 40. Maybe he gets a little winded, uh, but he shouldn't be as frail as he is in real life. I get it, Patrick Stewart is almost 80 years old, but in the context of Star Trek, he should be a middle-aged man if humans can live to be 200. He shouldn't be old and frail. So I didn't really like them showing him being like an old frail man who gets winded going up a building, but whatever. So the hunters beam in and they attack. Uh, they start firing. Picard dodges them. Uh, she runs in and she just attacks and again she goes all River Tam on them and just completely starts destroying these people. She starts breaking them, killing them, throwing them around. One gets his helmet busted open and we see that he's a Romulan, which... Okay, I guessed that, that, you know, because they're insisting on tying this into the whole supernova thing. You knew they were going to be Romulans, because Alex Kurtzman is some kind of a boner for Romulans. So does Jar Jar Abrams, but I digress. So we see that a kind of cool fight scene ensues. We find out that these are Romulans who are trying to capture her. And when she knocks one down, he spits acid on her and she starts to melt and burn and it's kind of shocking. And then he also spits acid on one of their weapons, which she picked up. Which here, the weapons, they look generic sci-fi. They don't look anything like Romulan weapons, but that might just be for the sake of stealth so nobody can identify the weapons that they're using. But the Romulan spits acid on her and the weapon she's holding and the weapon blows up and it vaporizes her. And Picard gets blown back and it's kind of a shocking scene. So the fact that this doesn't just completely kill Picard kind of ties in with the whole 80 would be 40. So he's able to take the blast and gets blown back. She's vaporized and Dodge is dead. Um, what is with the acid blood? Since when do Romulans spit acid blood? I, I, I didn't know what the fuck that was. Um, now here is something that happens that I thought was kind of some bad writing. Picard write, wakes up at home at Chateau Picard and his two Romulan assistants who are refugees living with him. They say that the police said that he fell and that he was alone on the rooftop and that uh, the feeds showed that nobody was with him and then he said he was with her. He was with Dodge, and they're like, well, did she have a cloaking device? And no, if Picard was on a roof in San Francisco randomly, and he was in an explosion, and there was a firefight, people would have seen the firefight, okay? People would have seen the explosion. And if Picard was in it, they wouldn't just take him home and just drop him off at home. They wouldn't just be like, oh, he fell. And, you know, give him, give him a few hours, he'll be fine. No, he would wake up at Starfleet Medical and there would be a debriefing, there would be an investigation, there would be police, there would be Starfleet security, there would be all kinds of things. They wouldn't just take... That was tropey bad writing right there, okay? So Picard gets depressed and angry at his own failures and he, he doesn't like that he wasn't able to help the girl, he wasn't able to save her, which Moby Picard I can deal with, do without, but see, Patrick Stewart plays the part so well that he just owns it and it's, it's okay. It's a good scene, him just being angry with himself. So we cut to the Daystrom Institute. Picard meets with a woman, her name is Girardi, uh, and he asks about sentient androids made from flesh and blood, and she thinks he's joking. And he says, no, really, I just had tea with one. He says that she was made of flesh and blood. She tells him that that's not possible. And he asks, well, could it have been done? She said, well, flesh and blood was within our sights uh, before the ban, but sentient, not in a thousand years. 
he asked them how he had tea with one. And so they visit the Federation's Division of Advanced Synthetic Research. And he says, it's a ghost town now. There's only one other person there. And apparently the synths that wiped out Mars were built in this lab. And they've been banned now and they're only allowed to do uh, theoretical research now. Um, they can't make sense anymore. It's a violation of galactic treaty. Okay, here's another thing that bothered the crap out of me. They kept on saying that Galactic Federation news, that Picard saved the galaxy, uh, Galactic Treaty, Galaxy this, Galactic that. This is more Kurtzman and Kurtzman's ilk and J.J. Abrams not understanding how big space is and the way space works. In the time of the next generation, we had only explored, like, I think... 10% of the Alpha Quadrant, the Beta Quadrant. There was still so much more to explore. Okay, Voyager explored a very big part of the Delta Quadrant. This is true, but and Voyager did bring back slipstream technology. And But even if, even if we manage slipstream technology, and even taking into account the Bajoran wormhole into the Gamma Quadrant, and even taking into account all of the knowledge from the Delta Quadrant which Voyager brought back. And even taking into account using slipstream technology to be able to go anywhere in the galaxy, it wouldn't be a galactic treaty. It wouldn't be galactic law. There's still Alpha, Beta, Delta, and Gamma Quadrants. And a lot of it is still unexplored. They need to stop just throwing the word galactic around. We're not operating in a galaxy-wide spanning federation, okay? The Kazon and all the other races, the Borg and the Vodwar and the Fendomar and the Herogen and all the other races out there in the Delta Quadrant and the Dominion in the Gamma Quadrant. All of those different races out there are not part of the Federation. They're not part of us. Okay, it wouldn't be Galactic. It would be Federation. It would be Alpha or Beta Quadrant. Okay, Earth is in the Beta Quadrant. Okay, the Romulans, most of their territory is in the Beta Quadrant. Stop saying galactic. Galactic is the wrong word to use. So they can't make sense anymore because of the violation of galactic treaty. Ugh. So she shows him B4, and B4 is in a box, and she says that he was an inferior copy, and that Data had downloaded most of his uh, memories and all of his data into B4, and that they tried to recover it, and then most of it was lost. And she mentions Bruce Maddox. That's nice continuity that they haven't forgotten about Measure of a Man, and they haven't forgotten about Bruce Maddox. And that Bruce came close to reproducing Data's neural net, but they got shut down after the ban, and they had crushed him. And after that, Bruce disappeared. She explains without Data's technology and his neural net that you can't make a soon type android, basically. If they could make the positronic brain, flesh and blood would be relatively easy. So Picard shows her the necklace and he asks her if it means anything to her. And she says, where did you get that? And Picard responds from my tea drinking companion. So it turns out the necklace is a symbol uh, for fractal neuronic cloning. Radical, beautiful idea of Maddox. It's a theory that he had that, that you could reconstitute Data's entire code, even his memories from a single positronic neuron. Picard puts two and two together and he's like, well, if Maddox actually perfected this and he made Dodge and he made a neural net and he put it in flesh and blood, then Data could still live in essence. An essence of him could still be alive. So they th pretty much parse out that that's how she knew to go find Picard, that that's how she was able to hack his location, that that's how she's able to fight why she's special, that she's got an essence of data inside of her, and she's a positronic brain inside of a flesh and blood body, which I haven't made up my mind if I think that's dumb or not. It's an interesting story idea. So, Gerardi tells Picard that synths are made in pairs, that they're twins. So we find out that there's going to be another one. So Dodge is dead, but there's another one. And Picard realizes there's a chance that still... There's something of data still live out there. There's a chance. We cut to a Romulan ship flying through space and it enters what is called the Romulan Reclamation Site. We meet Dodge's twin. Her name is Soji Asha and she meets with a Romulan named Narek. He comments on her working that she's just getting off, uh, getting off shift and that he's just arriving. 
He comments on her necklace. She says that her father made two of them, one for her, one for her sister, that she's a twin. And he tell, Narek tells her that he had a brother once, but he died about a year ago, uh, very unexpectedly. And they hit it off the cusp. They don't really say much. Uh, you're establishing that they're going to get to know each other. This will probably go somewhere, but eh, it could have been better. It could have been worse. It's whatever. And so when they start talking, we pull out and we find out that we're inside of a Borg vessel. And it's a pretty cool shot. Uh, we see some regeneration alcoves. We see some Borg stuff. We pull out. Borg ship. Uh, there are Romulan ships flying all in and out of it. You got these Romulan cruisers. Which, next thing. I feel like these Romulan ships, okay, they're 25% different. They're original. They're bad robot. This is them doing their own thing. That's fine, okay? The last shot that we see are the Romulan ships all around the board cube. Then it cuts to a coming attraction for the coming season. Uh, my one criticism with that is I'd like to see some D. Derridixes and some Baldors. I know that we're going to see a 23rd century Romulan warbird. Which, that actually makes sense to me, okay? If the Romulans have their resources stretched, if they lost Romulus, if they're dealing with a crisis situation right now of reestablishing the Empire after the loss of the homeworld, it might make sense that some of their bigger ships are occupied, so they're using older ships from the 23rd century. I don't know. They, they haven't quite explained this, but all the ships we saw around the Borg vessel are new. And that's fine because we're in 2399, there would be new ships. But still, in 2399, I would like to see some D. Derridixes, and I would like to see some Baldors. Only comment there. And then it cuts, and yeah, that's about it. And it was an interesting, interesting episode, you know? It was 46 minutes, it was good length. It has some interesting ideas, some interesting premises. Brent Spiner, his de-aging looked decent. I think they did a pretty good job on him. Uh, I think Patrick Stewart played a pretty good Picard. All in all, I was entertained. I was held up in it. It maintained my focus. My only thing is that I want them to drop this galactic shit because the galaxy is very big, okay? They have not explored the whole thing. They don't have galactic treaty. It's not galactic federation. It's alpha and beta, gamma, delta. And they need, they need to watch... If Alex Kurtzman and Bad Robot are going to make Star Trek, they need to watch the rest of Star Trek, okay? I've seen TOS, I've seen TNG, DS9, Voyager, Enterprise. I've seen all the movies. I've seen it all. If you're going to make Star Trek, goddammit, you need to have seen all of Star Trek, even the animated series. You know, Yesteryear's an important episode. You need to see it all. I don't think that they have. It's not galactic. Okay, maybe they've seen Next Generation, maybe they've seen TOS, I don't think they've seen Deep Space Nine, I don't think they've seen Voyager, and I think they're aware of Archer. But they need to drop this galactic bullshit. And then they need to also remember that Picard, even though he's 80, 80 is the new 40 since humans live to be 200. And that's that's basically all I have to really say about it. Besides from all that, I thought it was pretty good. Even the redesigned Paris and San Francisco, I thought they looked just fine. I didn't like the reuse of the disco uh, Golden Gate Bridge. I, I could have done without that. I also didn't like the reporter jumping down Picard's throat and being xenophobic and kind of echoing today's political climate. That kind of hurt my head a little. Also, they are the Romulan Empire. They control a vast swath of space in the Beta Quadrant. They have hundreds, if not thousands of ships. Okay? They can evacuate Romulus. They don't need the Federation's help to do that. And they have other planets. They would not just instantly all become refugees with the loss of Romulus. Okay? They have many, many planets. It's called an empire. Empire means big. They have other worlds. They're not all just refugees. Okay? The Romulans would not turn to the Federation for 10,000 ships. Okay, maybe they would ask for their help, but they wouldn't need it. They could do this on their own. They would have other allies, you know? They could turn to the Gorn, they could turn to the Tholians, they could turn to the Brain, they could turn to any number of other races that are near their space besides just the Federation. Now, the Federation was their ally in the Dominion War, so maybe they would turn to them because the Federation fought alongside them in the war. That is a plausible thing, and that I could accept, and that's fine. But they are an empire. 
okay? And they don't need all that help. They just don't. Um, the holograms, like I said, they work because the visitor in Deep Space Nine established 2D consoles were outmoded. So that's fine. The redesigned Chateau Picard, again, is fine because in Star Trek Generations we find out that there was a fire, so the whole house could have burned down for all we know. Again, that is fine. I like the new replicator. I liked all of that. In closing, the last thing I'll say is the Hobo Supernova is stupid. Supernova is not going to threaten an entire galaxy. It will threaten a solar system. And the only way that that's, that Supernova can threaten Romulus and can threaten the entire galaxy is stupid techno babble, stuff that you have to make up to explain it because J.J. Abrams and Alex Kirschman don't understand how big space is and how space works. Supernova is dumb. Alex Kurtzman doubling down on a story that he wrote for Star Trek 09 and having to use the Supernova is dumb. I don't know why they hate the Romulans and the Vulcans, why they keep killing off pointy ears. Just stop. Supernova dumb. And that's my review. Star Trek Picard was pretty good. Um, I'm looking forward to next week. I hope it stays good. I hope it keeps up the momentum. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing what comes next. If you listened for this long, thank you for listening. I hope you enjoy it. It's worth it. I, I want to say don't pay for all access because you don't want to support it. But at the same time, this is Star Trek. It's Patrick Stewart. It's real Trek. Um, you should support it because we don't want to see it fail. We want to see it succeed, right? I, I, yeah, you know, you can torrent it. You can pirate it. But don't do that. Just don't. If you got Amazon Prime and you live outside the U.S., watch it on Amazon Prime. If you're in Canada, watch it on Space. If you're in America, I guess get all access. There's no other choice. But one way or another, watch it, support the show. It's good. I like it so far. I just hope it maintains the momentum. Uh, thanks for listening. Have a great day. And that's it.